Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here and to welcome you to the fourth webinar in a series of webinars on community violence intervention. In this webinar, you will learn about community centered evaluation within community violence intervention. My name is Dr. Gail Holmes Payne. I'm an evaluator and chief of the prevention practice and translation branch in the division of violence prevention at Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. Before we launch into the substance of the webinar, I will note that this session is being recorded and will be posted online at a later date. All presenter slides will also be posted online when the recording is made available. Also, participants can access closed captioning through the multimedia tab on the right side of your screen or by using the link and code posted in the chat. Finally, we are interested in your feedback and insights on community violence interventions. In the chat box for this webinar, we will provide a link to a survey form. Your participation in this survey is optional and all responses will be anonymous. Over the next 90 minutes, you will hear three presentations and a discussion among four experts. We will talk about various community-centered approaches to program evaluation. We will discuss various benefits to each methodology, and we will share lessons learned, as well as promising and effective practices to evaluation. First up, it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Julie Rodriguez, who will be providing opening remarks. Ms. Rodriguez is the Deputy Assistant to President Biden and Director of the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Mrs. Rodriguez? Thank you so much, um, Dr. Holmes Payne, for uh, you know, joining us today, for moderating today's really critical conversation. Um, and just on behalf of the White House, I really want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar and for working every day to prevent crime and to address um, the ongoing epidemic and root causes of gun violence. As many of you all know, investing in evidence-based community violence intervention is a key pillar of President Biden's holistic strategy to prevent and respond to gun crime. The president in June laid out his comprehensive gun crime prevention strategy to really be able to give and to equip state and local leaders with multiple tools and unprecedented resources to be able to tackle this multifaceted challenge of gun violence that has been plaguing so many communities for far too long. Now his um, you know, multi uh, sort of pronged approach and comprehensive approach focuses on a couple of key areas. Number one, investing in community violence intervention programs, expanding employment opportunities for teenagers and young adults, supporting local enforcement hiring, helping the formerly incarcerated successfully re-enter communities, and stemming the flow of illegal firearms. Now, President Biden sees gun violence as an epidemic, as a real public health crisis, and he talks often about the impacts that it has to individuals and to entire communities. And as we go into today's discussion, I think it's important to remember that 40,000 lives are lost a year. Every day, over 300 people are shot. And like so many other crises impacting our communities, black and brown communities have carried the heaviest share of the burden. Now, these shootings are disproportionately concentrated in neighborhoods harmed by past and present discrimination, segregation, redlining, disinvestment, mass incarceration, and concentrated poverty. And the community trauma and loss of life that these communities have experienced have devastating consequences for families and cascading human, social, and economic costs. Now, the good news is that as we face these daunting challenges, we know that there are community-based strategies that we'll discuss today that are working to save lives. And that is why we are here to really begin to learn more about these promising practices, these efforts that are underway that we know are having a critical impact, and to really look at how do we expand that to ensure that we are saving more lives and creating more opportunities for those in our communities. 
Now, this is a historic moment. The president is committed to really investing in community violence intervention work and to turn it from an approach championed by uh, some very dedicated, committed folks who, again, you'll hear from today to a nationally recognized, well resourced strategy for reducing gun violence and increasing public safety throughout the country. So thank you all again so much for taking time out of your schedules to join today. Thank you so much to those presenting for your hard work and your uh, critical investment in our communities. And now I'd like to turn it back over um, to Dr. Holmes Payne to get us started. Thank you. Okay, our first presenter is Dr. Katerina Roman. She's a professor of criminal justice at Temple University. Dr. Roman, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. I've been asked to provide an overview of what evaluation research is and how evidence supporting community violence intervention is built, as well as the caveats and biases that are present in the knowledge that currently exists. The field of CVI is working toward long-term sustainable progress. We have to get it right. We have to think about how to build and feature the successes of community-based programming. No one has ever simply policed their way out of community violence. I'm going to provide the backdrop for this presentation first, then discuss what is evaluation research, why evaluation research is important, the types of evaluation relevant for building the evidence and some important caveats. So we know that community violence intervention is quite complex. There are few resounding successes. Successes are not easily maintained. Success in one place is not necessarily success somewhere else. Most academics don't have lived experience, so the research created may not reflect community truths. Sound of it, evaluation in and of itself is difficult, often at odds with what a program needs and the goals of the program. But policymakers want solutions now, and quick results of violence reduction tends to end up being a policing intervention or a policing led intervention. And when resources are scarce, we often have choices to make, and that choice, if it's one intervention, often ends up being policing. So that's the backdrop, and where do we go from here? Well, I think about this as building the evidence. We need to build the evidence using a community-based evaluation approach. The definition of evaluation research I like best, I have here on the screen from Rossi and Freeman, a systematic application of social research procedures for assessing the conceptualization, design, implementation, and utility or the effectiveness of those programs. The evidence base is built from defining and designating evidence-based programs. And historically, I, I usually say there are four aspects to that. Programs are shown to have impact because of a rigorous scientific evaluation design. They're replicated and evaluated in various settings. Their findings then are subjected to critical review and published in respected journals, and they may also be certified as evidence-based. But we're also moving towards the recognition and recognizing the inequities in how research is produced, we're moving to incorporate strategies more often that bring communities to the forefront as experts. And this is how we can produce more meaningful knowledge that supports more meaningful action. Evaluation is important because it builds systematic knowledge through measurement. Knowledge program managers need to fulfill their obligation to offer consumers and families the most effective services, to help increase the quality of services through targeting the right resources. Evaluation can also help identify barriers that prevent systems from doing their best. It can recognize both successes and failures offering an opportunity to shift away from ineffective or less effective services to those that are more effective. And I think we all know about public accountability to show that the dollars are being used to provide services shown to be effective, a higher level of assurance of investment of public monies and having demonstrated results 
is a strong path to winning new grants and expanding service to more people and neighborhoods. So rigorous community engaged evaluation is also important so we can build the evidence that matters for community action and move away from some of these headlines. These are headlines just from a couple of them are just from the last few weeks in the last year and a half. We have to be thinking about and understanding the limitations that bring us to these headlines. And the evidence on the non policing community based violence interventions is promising, but it is mixed. But if you unpack how the research is produced, you would begin to see the biases and the caveats and, and what that means when someone is standing back looking at the body of literature and trying to make decisions. For instance, historically, there's been much more federal, state, and local funding that supports law enforcement related interventions. Public and policymakers have to weigh the amount of evidence. That's that's sort of their go-to. They just look at the amount of evidence and might not look deeper to understand those biases. Another issue is that existing evidence on law enforcement interventions might tout the effects on gun violence, but most of those evaluation studies on policing interventions are not examining the potential harms of the intervention, such as those that might come from over surveillance or the systemic biases that we know the criminal justice system has. The point here is that comparing person focused community based interventions to policing led interventions is not a fair comparison. And these next few slides are just examples of that. So here I have pulled from a recent uh, solicitation. So going back to what I said just a minute ago about there being more dollars for law enforcement intervention, more law enforcement interventions simply also means more opportunities for research. If you couple that with the existence of a number of the DOJ funding portfolios, even those like CBCR that are geared toward communities stress the need for partnering with law enforcement or ha having law enforcement take a lead role. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm saying we need to look at how research is produced, right? And these same funding portfolios may also dictate a research partner. You can see what I highlighted down on the, on the bottom here, leading to a higher likelihood that it's the law enforcement focused programs that will be evaluated, building the amount of evidence, not necessarily looking at what the core evidence base and the promising interventions may be. Here's another example of how the outcomes are skewed. My colleagues and I, led by Jeff Butts at John Jay, were asked by Arnold Ventures to look at non-policing interventions and to review the evidence. And when we sat down to do that, some of us pulled out the crimesolutions.gov database and entered in the filters, strong evidence, crime prevention, high crime neighborhood. That database yielded 17 programs, but of those 17, the overwhelming majority had law enforcement as the key partner. So with these caveats in mind, let me just turn back to what constitutes the scientific evidence for evaluation. This means rigorous controlled designs using experimental or quasi experimental evaluation methods. I'm not going to go into the detail of this evidence hierarchy, but I'm going to sort of refer to it in the whole as I finish up my comments. And, and in thinking about building the evidence base, I think it's most important to understand the types of evaluations that community organizations and agencies should be thinking about for building the evidence. And there's four here. An impact evaluation is at the higher end of that pyramid, focusing on the questions of causality. Did the program have its intended effects? Performance mo monitoring measures the key aspects of how systems operate and the extent to which specific objectives are being attained. You've heard of inputs, outputs, summarizing these processes and activities, and this is often part of a process evaluation. And it's the process evaluation that establishes how the program is op operating and documents the procedures undertaken in the service delivery. It does not in and of itself 
establish effectiveness. It needs to be incorporated in an impact evaluation. And last, there's the cost evaluation, addressing how much the program costs, preferably in relation to alternative uses of the same resources, perhaps business as usual, and thinking about the benefits that are also produced. And in, in thinking about, and we can come back to this in, in the Q&A if people are interested in the types of evaluation, but I just wanna hit home that people often ask what level of evidence is needed for a program or policy adoption. And I would argue that the better question is, what is the best approach for generating knowledge that will bring us to improvements in public safety. It's short-sighted to grab the nearest results from an RCT and say, we should do this. One or two experiments does not tell you what will happen after broader implementation or policy adoption that's more general. And those studies may not have been generated in a careful community engaged way, one in which both positive and the potential negative outcomes or the harms are studied. So this is where process evaluation, cost evaluation come in, doing a more comprehensive, collaborative, community engaged approach to evaluation and building the evidence that way. And this just, this, these three intersecting circles, you have EBP, the evidence-based program in the middle, but it's taking into consideration practitioner expertise, moving that more into the forefront of, of where it's been historically, thinking about participant values and expectations and getting their observations and the researcher getting to know a lot and everything. If the researcher is not from the community, getting to know, really getting to know the community to help co-produce knowledge here. And the last thing I want to just focus on before I conclude is that by doing these comprehensive community engaged evaluation methods, we'll be able to say more about the causal mechanisms of change. This is what I think has been missing from the evidence base. How is the outcome produced? We may know that police, you know, think about focused deterrence programs. We have a model, we have a logic model, and then we know from evaluation of these, you know, you heard of the group violence intervention, these focused deterrence interventions, that shootings go down in a community after. But what is the mechanism? There hasn't been one evaluation that tells us, is that specific deterrence? Is that general deterrence? Is that the, are people being detained? Are communities understanding what this is and, and, and changing their norms? We don't know the answers to these questions, yet we take results and we say, this, this is what we should be doing. And this, again, is just bringing us back to the pyramid in saying we need to have so many stakeholders together working on a comprehensive evaluation approach, unpacking, learning from each other, unpacking, unpacking what is happening in this change. So in conclusion, what does this all mean? Well, I think about it as rigorous evaluation research plus community partners at the fore, increasing the likelihood that your study's findings will be used, your program, the study of your program will be used to advance policy and practice because true collaboration provides the foundation for shared responsibility and that collective competence, and we're learning from each other. And we wanna measure your desired outcomes, your outcomes that you believe are important in the program, but also collect data to elucidate other outcomes as well. And I know we'll talk more about that in the, in the Q&A. So the last thing I will say is, just a push for this collective knowledge and for funding that prioritizes these partnerships between researchers and practitioners, learning for each other and helping to build communities capacity for evaluation re research. I think that's how we build the evidence base for CVI. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roman. True collaboration with participants and stakeholders. Our next speaker will continue this theme, Dr. Barbara Israel. 
She is a professor of health behavior and health education and the director of the Detroit Community Academic Urban Research Center at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Dr. Israel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. I'm delighted. I appreciate the opportunity and delighted to be here with the moderator and thank the organizers and thank my other fellow presenters. I also want to acknowledge some of my colleagues at the University of Michigan who are listed on this slide, whose work um, I'm part of, but they are certainly instrumental in. Um, I've been asked, and I really appreciate Katerina's comments. I think you'll see that what I talk, am talking about fits nicely uh, with the pers uh, perspectives that she was sharing. Um, I was asked to talk about a particular approach to evaluation and evaluation research uh, that actively engages community in the process, uh, something I refer to it and others as community-based participatory research. I want to give a couple examples of some uh, CBPR partnership projects that we've done um, and hope that this will help and have implications for the work that you all are doing. And not sure why it's not advancing. Any suggestions from our moderate or tech people? Okay, there we go. So I want to start by, sorry about that, um, providing a rationale for this approach to research. Um, these are things I think you're all familiar with, but I think it's useful because people often say, well, why would you involve community in the, in the research and evaluation process? Um, and so first of all, recognizing that there are stressors in the social and physical environment that are associated with community and violence and poor health outcomes. Um, and these stressors include neighborhood and structural conditions, uh, such as gun violence, lack of access to safe places to be physically active, um, intimate partner violence, trauma, unemployment, poverty, racism, uh, again, numerous stressors um, that people face in their communities. And again, I'm not sure why it's... Ted, do you have a suggestion? Okay, now it worked. Very strange. Sorry about that. This I hope won't continue. Uh, uh, the burden of disease that's born um, caused and associated with these stressors is borne by low income communities and communities of color that have greater exposure to these stressors. Um, at the same time, and really importantly, is to recognize there's an extensive set of skills, strengths, and resources that exist among community members. Um, for example, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, social networks and relationships. Um, and so again, in spite of the stressors, there are also these strengths and resources. So yes, Ted, would, okay. Historically, um, research and evaluation has not always directly benefited and sometimes actually harmed the communities involved. The Tuskegee syphilis study being the most well-known um, what people often call refer to parachute model of research where people drop in, collect information and disappear. Um, it doesn't benefit the communities at all. The communities that are most impacted by health inequities have been the least likely to be involved in the research and evaluation process. Um, and this has resulted in an understandable distrust of and reluctance to participate in research and evaluation. Next slide. Public health interventions have not been as effective as they could be because they're not tailored to the concerns and cultures of participants. Uh, rarely do they include participants in design and evaluation, and they're often focused on individual behavior change with less attention to the broader social and structural determinants um, that I was talking about before. Next, please. As a result of this, uh, there have been increasing calls for more comprehensive and participatory approaches to research and evaluation. Uh, in, uh, fortunately, from my perspective, there's also been increasing support for such partnership approaches, both through federal uh, government as well as foundations. And community-based participatory research is one such partnership approach. There's many other labels and names, participatory research, participatory action research, action research. Um, my colleagues and I would use the CBPR label. It's used in many health and social service circles 
um, but the label itself is not as important as the points that you know I'd like to cover. So the definition, next slide, of CBPR is it's a partnership approach to research and evaluation that equitably involves all partners in all aspects of the research and evaluation process. Um, the emphasis here is on equity, um, sharing power and resources and ideas, uh, decision making. It enables all partners to contribute their expertise with shared responsibility and ownership. Um, it enhances understanding of a given phenomenon. You know, we're trying to understand does this intervention work? Um, and then it integrates that knowledge with other interventions, their evaluation and policy change. Next slide. So just to quickly summarize a few of the key principles of CBPR. First of all, it builds on those community strengths and resources. It doesn't start with a deficit problem model, but rather starts from a strength perspective. It promotes collaborative and equitable partnerships, bringing diverse people around the table to share their knowledge and expertise and recognize the different knowledge and expertise that everybody brings to the table. Next slide, please. It facilitates co-learning um, and capacity building. And the recognition here is that as evaluators, we have a lot to learn from communities uh, and communities can learn about the evaluation and the research process. Um, it addresses issues of race, ethnicity, racism, and social class, and embraces the concept of cultural humility. Next slide. It disseminates findings to all partners and involves them in the dissemination process. It's actually quite rare for me to be presenting by myself. I usually always co-present with a community partner. Uh, it's a very important piece of what we try to do. Um, it promotes a long-term process and commitment. It recognizes that the complexity of the issue and certainly community violence being a good example, um, and as Katerina referred to, um, it's, these are not the kinds of things we're gonna resolve in one year, two year, or one funded project, right? Um, but builds on and has this long-term commitment to the partnership as well as the issues being faced. So now I want to talk uh, briefly about a couple of projects. Well, one more, sorry, one other point. Um, just to emphasize is that CBPR is an approach to evaluation and research. It's not a method per se. So rather, uh, and it's not a specific research design. So all of the designs that Katerina was referring to earlier um, are applicable within the context of a CBPR approach. Also, you can use qualitative, quantitative methods, mixed methods. So again, um, CBPR is applicable for that. And it's particularly applicable for um, designing, implementing, and evaluating interventions like community violence interventions. Next slide, please. So now I'd like to talk briefly about a couple of part, a partnership and a couple of projects. The Healthy Environments Partnership, or HEP, uh, has been together since 2000, uh, trying to understand and promote heart health in Detroit, uh, looking at social and physical environment and racial and socioeconomic inequities and cardiovascular disease, and then developing, implementing, and evaluating interventions to address them. Uh, listed below here are all the community-based organizations that are part of the partnership. Um, we've engaged in a number of different studies um, and want to just focus on one today. Uh, next slide, please. What we refer to as Catch Path, it's a multi level intervention. Um, I will also refer to it as Pathways to Heart Health, which has um, really taken some of the earlier uh, studies that we did about what are the issues that community members are concerned about. Uh, in several neighborhoods in Detroit, and what do people want to do engaged in a participatory planning process to figure out what do we want to do to address those, again, all with a, the steering committee of community partner organizations guiding the way. Um, and we ended up with a multi-level intervention that both promoted walking, promoted community leadership and sustainability, and promoted activity-friendly neighborhoods. And I just want to say a few words about the promotion of walking component. Don't have time to go into all the others today. So the next slide, please. So walk your heart to health walkers. Uh, this was a walking group intervention uh, promoting heart healthy behaviors. We had a heavy emphasis on social support um, for heart healthy activities and also group cohesion. 
Um, and what I want in the context of today's conversation about evaluation is really more to emphasize the rigorous evaluation that was done with this intervention. Uh, we did pre and post surveys. We had health indicators, including blood pressure, lipid levels, a glucose, body mass index, waist circumference. We also looked at attitude, social support. We involved, we had pedometers to monitor steps, um, uh, participant observation, and so forth. If we look at the next slide, please, it looks a little overwhelming, but um, I, we used, and apropos to what Katerina again was presenting, what we refer to as a lag design. So this was a random sample study, but rather than having a control group as a traditional random sample or clinical trial, um, everybody got the intervention. So we, at what was called time one, we collected baseline data, and then the first group was randomly assigned, participated in the intervention for two months, and the second group didn't. Um, they started after that two month period, hence the lagged design. Um, and then we were able to, in effect, they served like a control group because they didn't get the intervention initially. Um, and um, this has been something that's very much in keeping with the CBPR approach uh, because having a control group where community members don't get anything, if you will, um, doesn't fit in with the principles and, and concepts of CBPR. Next slide, please. So again, briefly what we learned, um, the, I don't have time to go into all the details, but the walking groups, uh, over 600 participants that were involved over an eight month period, uh, the intervention increased physical activity, reduced blood glucose levels, blood pressure, body mass index, increased in social support, social cohesion. Um, and based on the evidence um, and the rigorous evaluation design, this is now considered part of the evidence-based uh, National Cancer Institute, among others, lists this intervention model um, as an evidence-based intervention. Um, again, picking up on what Katerina was talking about. Um, the other interventions we involved um, doing capacity building work with others in the city to be able to run their own walking groups. Uh, we also had a mini grant program where community members could apply for funding to improve the built environment in their neighborhoods, like improve sidewalk conditions. And we also did policy advocacy training where people got involved in trying to train to impact policies. For example, to tear down abandoned houses that were considered at risk uh, for lots of issues uh, in the neighborhoods. So that was part of the multi level component, if you will. Next, I want to just briefly share another project that HEP conducted um, and starting with sort of the need. This is an evaluation of a, the Detroit's poverty tax exemption program uh, to increase awareness and uptake. Uh, as you all know, housing is a multidimensional determinant of health and housing affordability and accessibility is linked to multiple negative health outcomes. Um, I want to say this, what I'm talking about in this slide is sort of, this was the case that uh, the Healthy Environments Partnership looked at, the need, um, and then based on that decided on the evaluation. So between 2010 and 18, more than 125,000 homes in Detroit were entered into foreclosure auction due to tax foreclosures, uh, which have a tremendous impact, for example, on homelessness, blight, poverty status, violence. Um, homeowners with, but in accordance with the Michigan state law, homeowners with incomes near or below the federal poverty level are eligible for property taxes to be reduced in a half or even eliminated. Uh, but what they found was that the majority of homeowners eligible for poverty tax exemption benefit didn't receive them. From 2012 to 16, less than 12% of those who are eligible for uh, receive such benefits. Next slide, please. So the HEP partnership, this was a big concern for them. They wanted to understand why do low-income homeowners eligible for property tax relief through Detroit's PTE program rarely obtain it. We used a CBPR approach and a case study approach. We included document review. We conducted in-depth interviews with Detroit homeowners who received counseling assistance from United Community Housing Coalition, a community-based organization partner uh, in this partnership. Next slide, please. And then just quickly, some of the findings and policy implications from those interviews and document reviews, 82% of homeowners who previously had never applied for this, but they were qualified for tax exemption, 
Uh, 84% of those owed back taxes. They really were, their houses were subject to foreclosure. A number of barriers were identified, identified like the complication of applying for this, uh, what was supposed to be, again, people should have been easily eligible for. Uh, these findings were shared with the Detroit City Council and relevant government offices by the partnership. Um, and presently, the city is implementing several positive changes to make this program more widely accessible. Uh, and the partnership continues to work to implement other policy recommendations. So uh, I had a few more slides on the benefits of CBPR, but I will stop uh, at this point and I can come back to those in the discussion as uh, desired. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Israel. Um, let's hear some more about CBPR. Our next speakers will share an example, Rosanna Ander and Eddie Bocanegra. Ms. Ander is the founding executive director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab and Education Lab Builders. Mr. Bocanegra is the senior director of Heartland Alliance, Ready Chicago. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. So, so Eddie and I are going to try to co-present uh, just as we've tried to walk side by side and, and in many ways, hand in hand over the last couple of years with this uh, work that we've been doing together and, and many other partners that um, we will be uh, sharing much of their work as well. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking the administration for um, taking such a big and bold and important step in making an investment in an area that has been so neglected and underinvested in and to do it in a way that is both trying to uh, invest directly in communities, but also to try to generate insights and lessons so that we can continue to get better over time to really understand what it will take to ensure that um, your zip code does not determine your life outcomes. Um, so, so really delighted to, to see the efforts by the administration. So we're going to talk about um, the work that we did around Ready Chicago. Um, and uh, Eddie's going to be jumping in on a, a couple of places, but I want to just sort of set up a little bit of the context um, that really tries to get at some of the really important points that Katarina and Barbara made around trying to do research in a, in a fundamentally different way that really does engage um, the those for whom um, the benefits are, are going to be most important or the consequences of failure are going to be most uh, important. Um, so I would be remiss to not acknowledge that I, uh, my organization uh, is based at the University of Chicago, an institution with a long and storied history um, of uh, many things to be very proud of, but also a legacy that we need to still um, address around how research has been done in places like the University of Chicago. And for example, uh, it's one of the things that was important to us when we started the University of Chicago Crime Lab uh, in 2008 was to really try to change the way uh, a research university like the University of Chicago engages in the world around it. Um, and to put it more pointedly, um, what good is having more Nobel Prizes uh, than just about any place on the planet if folks who uh, live and work uh, around the university won't walk two blocks to the south or two blocks to the west in our home city of Chicago because there is a lack of fundamental basic safety. So how can we leverage the, the resources of a place like the University of Chicago, but really turn it uh, toward issues that are causing uh, life, death, and, and harms to our home community? And how can we work in partnership to co-produce the kind of evidence that's needed to guide policy and practice? And so that was the sort of fundamental motivation for starting the Crime Lab. Um, so I want to sort of tell the story of how we got to the Ready program and how we've worked together. So, um, you know, obviously in 2020, our country and, and many cities experienced incredible surges in homicides and shootings and, and gun violence. Uh, we had a sort of uh, earlier um, experience in 2016 in Chicago where we had an uh, enormous surge in gun violence in 2016. Every single month of 2016 was higher in terms of homicides and shootings than the same month the year before. So this was not what people often think of as a, a little sort of statistical uh, blip where things go up a little bit, go down a little bit. We had 300 additional homicide victims in 2016 compared to 2015. That's more homicide victims than the entire city of New York, and that was just our increase relative to the year before. So suffice it to say, the city was in crisis, and it's not as though the good old days 
prior to 2016 were so great either. So it was incredibly important that we sort of roll our sleeves up. Everybody uh, think about what they could do to lend effort to the city of Chicago to try to address this crisis um, and to identify things that could have an impact both in the short run while we also continue to work at the sort of long, long run sort of root cause issues as well. Um, and so we rolled our sleeves up and, and said, what can we do that does not continue to put pedal to the metal on what has been the dominant policy response to crime and violence in our country. And that has been a reliance on the criminal justice system, policing and the criminal justice system. And we all know the sort of impact that that's had in terms of making us an incredible outlier in, in civilized society and the harms that have come from that. So we wanted to think beyond what the usual responses had been to uh, increases in crime and violence. Sorry, my computer problems, apologies. Um, and just wanted to recognize that when we think about what can we do to reduce gun violence, we need to recognize that the harms of gun violence are disproportionately, uh, the burden is disproportionately um, felt by black men in our country. Um, and so, but that is also the same population that has borne the disproportionate burden of the reliance on the criminal justice responses. So we wanted to think about how can we both reduce the harms of the criminal justice system, but also reduce gun violence and do those things uh, simultaneously or together. Um, and I think one other thing to recognize is so often the focus of resources is on young people. When we think about the violence problem or, or gun violence, it often gets framed as a youth violence um, a challenge. And I think it's important to recognize in many, many cities that those who are being shot or being arrested for being involved in shootings, the majority of them are, uh, at least from a legal definition, over the age of 18. And so when you think about what infrastructure, what supports and what resources we have to bring to bear to immediately address those who are bearing the burden, men uh, over the age of 18 and, and often well over the age of 18, when you look at that infrastructure, there's precious little that we have to, to offer them. So it really did require thinking about how do we build some new structures and processes in place that uh, either only barely existed or didn't exist at all. Um, so I'm going to let Eddie tell the story of how we sort of came together in the midst of this crisis in, in our home city to try to both leverage existing evidence, but also go beyond because there is not it yet enough evidence, as, as Katerina, I think, so eloquently pointed out, there's not the sort of level of evidence that we would like to be able to draw from in a moment of crisis like 2016 or like we're experiencing today. So I'm going to let Eddie uh, speak to how how we um, came together to, to really co-design this, this pro both the intervention and the evaluation work. So I'm hoping, I know Eddie had a computer problem, I'm hoping he's back on. Thank you, Rosanna. Uh Appreciate this, and I might just ask you to kind of help me uh, move along the slides because I'm having some computer issues here, so I apologize. Um, just building on what you just said just a second ago, and from our other distinguished um, guest panelists here, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we we have we have and continue to face in the field of violence prevention is the lack of consistent evidence about the effectiveness of our work. And I say this as someone who has done this work on the ground as an interrupter, as an outreach worker. Uh, and someone who's also directed programs at the YMCA and other places, including at Heart Alliance with the Ray Chicago model. And it's interesting because unlike policing, which has growing body of evidence, which suggests it is effective and reducing crime, but which also incurs significant social costs on black and brown communities, as uh, it was highlighted just a moment ago. You know, at the end of the day, violence prevention doesn't have a robust body of evidence behind it. And in large part, it has to do with inconsistent funding as one of the primary reasons as well. Um, and I say that just to kind of add, add to the comments that were shared earlier as well. Uh, and I'm happy to further discuss the, what, what that means and other challenges around that. So as a result, we still have many questions about which particular programs work for whom, why they work, and how it impacts change or don't when we scale these programs. I believe this lack of evidence has implications for the acceptance of violence prevention as an alternative to policing, and it has limited our ability to effectively scale successful programs to cities around the country. And we're seeing that even today, more so when we're seeing 40 cities uh, in our country grappling with the spike of gun violence as well. 
Another challenge we faced is, is that um, this field is pretty stagnant. Uh, the field of gun violence is a very stagnant field. And when it comes to high risk, working with high risk population, the bar of quality services is quite low. So there needs to be a lot more innovation in that space. And I believe that things like violence interruption and mediation uh, are important, but it's not enough. It's a starting point to a journey of, uh, for individuals in their transformation. And I believe that jobs are important, but are also not sufficient. Many of those who are most likely to be involved with violence face extraordinary barriers and challenges. So we need to think about all of those needs and tailor programs and, and the entire systems to support both the individual and their families, ultimately, you know, leading to their communities. Uh, in this moment where the federal government is poised to invest more than it ever has in violence prevention and hopefully takes calculated risk, uh, it is important that we learn as much as possible uh, and to do as much as we can to address this crisis in hand. Uh, thank you. Um, so, British Chicago was born out of a partnership between Heart and Alliance, you know, other grassroots community based organizations, the private sector partners, and research from the University of Chicago, University of Michigan, and Cornell. In 2016, uh, as the city was poised uh, to record high, uh, considering one of the deadliest years uh, in the last 20 years uh, up to that point, it really forced uh, many uh, communities, philanthropy, nonprofits, governments, uh, sports alliances, and others to really think about what can we possibly do? What is the evidence? What's, what's existing evidence out there that we can leverage to really tackle this issue? Um, and ultimately, that, that actually gave birth to in Chicago. You know, we reviewed the existing evidence about what works, what doesn't work. Uh, we looked at the research here in Chicago. Uh, we looked at other, other programs like jobs, kind of behavior therapy. And again, that's what, what landed to what we're building right now with Ready. Uh, what's also important for me to highlight is that the design of Ready grew out of the research practitioners. Uh, it, was, it was developed through collaboration of partners, uh, both that are involved directly with Ready, but also people who have been in this field. Uh, and the fact that philanthropy was really, really seriously willing to invest in innovation and take a bold uh, step uh, in the right direction. Next slide. So we, we know that um, we we knew then uh, that it's not easy working with this population, uh, particularly those who are the most at risk of gun and violence. Uh, and to draw a connection uh, with these individuals is extremely critical. It, it's not enough to say that we're working with high risk individuals. We truly have to create a model that is designed. To risk to to address those who we consider are further marginalized, even within the marginalized, uh, and we need to do a lot, a lot of this work to learn more about how do we continue to build trust, how do we create environments where they can flourish, uh, and how do we provide provide supportive services for them as well. So we invest a lot of in the recruitment, in the outreach, and the engagement stages of our work. Um, once we identify the individuals who are who uh, we consider participants into ready. The outreach staff use their networks, in many cases, even public information like social media, court documentation to locate some of our partners. And here's what I mean by that. Here's what I, what I enjoy about our partnership with the Crime Lab as well, is that in addition to leveraging human intel from street outreach workers and interrupters, we also leverage our partnership with the Department of Corrections and the Cook County Jails to also help identify individuals who are at the highest risk of gun involvement. Typically, young people, typically people who are either on house arrest for gun cases or people who are on parole for, for uh, uh, felony um, possessions of weapons as well. But the other interesting part here is that we do leverage uh, the University of Chicago's crime lab uh, in terms of their uh, social network analysis to help us identify, provide another tool for the outreach team to identify individuals who are also at the highest risk and engage them in a way that we typically have not been able to do so. So, that in itself. Has really created, um, has both disrupted the way that we go about our work, but has added value to the field of outreach and interruption work. Um, sorry, one, one last thing that I want to I want to make sure I add to the last slide too. Um, what's also very important about the initiative that we're pointing here is is that what we learn is that you know we provide CBT, uh, we provide a lot of professional development um, for our, all of our participants, and we started off doing this about three times a week. And what what in the last 
first three years of this program, what, when we look at the data, uh, and this is the importance about partnership, when we're able to look at trends, we're able to look at data uh, and interviewing focus groups or participants, we learned that it was more important for us to front load a lot of the CBT uh, with our participants. Where before we were doing uh, one hour, um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and now we're doing um, an hour and a half, uh, five days a week. And so that uh, allows us to meet the benchmark of 100, which the data tells us that we have more uh, success and retention with our participants as well. And that's the beauty, again, about partnerships, not only with researchers, but also in the community, so they could also understand why we're making these decisions. Next slide. Sorry, I'm having a little problem with my computer here. So one thing I just want to sort of point out that that Eddie sort of um, alluded to is this was while we sort of had an idea of what might be helpful based on the existing research, um, we knew that it, it it had to be implemented with high quality and it had to be feasible to implement. So we worked really closely with uh, a range of community based organizations to each leverage their expertise and skills. And what the intervention, what the program looks like now is actually quite different than what it looked like on day one, because the goal wasn't to do a pristine laboratory experiment, but it was to try to do something in the real world that could make a difference in the enormous crisis our city was facing. And we recognized that we couldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We had to build in that design process so that as we were seeing and learning that things weren't working the way we thought, or the participants didn't engage in the way that we thought, that there was room for adaptation and innovation during the time that the um, the, the study was going on and, and, and continues to go on. So Eddie did touch on the three different pathways. Um, we recognize that the, the street outreach workers have relationships and knowledge in their own community and were a good source of expertise to identify people they would want to prioritize for intensive services and supports like Ready can offer. We also know that reentry is a time of enormous vulnerability and risk, and there's precious little support that's offered to people as they return to their home community. And then uh, we wanted to sort of focus on a subset of those returning uh, and to have a warm handoff and to be able to offer services and supports. And we also wanted to leverage the administrative data that the city has to also have another pathway in. All of these pathways have strengths and limitations, but we think the three of them together really do offer a very robust set of uh, ways to prioritize uh, individuals who, who might most benefit from, from this type of approach. Um, one of the things I want to, <laughs> excuse me, also point out is because of the ability to sort of uh, use the data and understand those who were going to be prioritized for this intervention, what is their sort of realized risk? What is the likelihood that um, the individuals that we're identifying uh, would experience some form of gun violence. And unfortunately, we can see that um, they face enormously high rates of gun violence involvement. Um, even compared to other Chicagoans, we could also show you compared to other men in their age group or even men in their neighborhood. So the, the gun violence rate per 100,000 for, for men who are eligible for ready is about 6,240 per 100,000 people. And that should just be unconscionable um, uh, by, by any rational uh, uh, standard. And so Ready really is doing an incredible job of identifying and engaging those um, facing the, the sort of highest risks for gun violence involvement. Um, and I'm going to let Eddie, uh, I think, I, I don't know if uh, we're, we're running out of time, so I'm going to let Eddie just talk about the, the way that the participants have engaged and, and developed an advisory committee to really help continue to shape the, the work of the, the intervention and the, and the study. Thanks, Rosanna. I'm sorry, I, I apologize. I'm, I, do, I am having some issues with my computer, but I'm going to see if hopefully you guys can hear me here too. Um, you know, at the end of the day, as we highlight some of the lessons that we're learning through Ready, and we hope we have some more time to discuss this, you know, it's not enough just to engage people uh, into a program. And we're not going to be able to program our way out of the situation that we find ourselves in. When we think about race and equity and empowering our communities, right? Um, and so a, a large part of what we are very intentional when we think about who it is that we're serving. You know, I think about in our program, and you'll hear me say this in just a second, about 37% of our participants have been survivors of gun violence. And so one of the things for us as we partner with institutions, we think about what does it really take to work with this population and um, how do they want to be engaged on these on these issues around 
reforming specific policies, so on. And so that gave birth to a, a small group of individuals who are self-identifying themselves as like, we want to do more in our community. So think about individuals who got two or three felony cases with guns who are saying, hey, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of actually having to navigate from one block to a block. I'm tired of the way the systems are treating us. You know, what can I do to take some ownership? And so that gave birth to what we call now the power group. It was a participant advisory committee that really allowed us to learn from them of how we could do our work much better. Um, but at the same time, that space um, translated to how they could also engage within the context of their own community. And so it's been very helpful for us in the sense of these individuals have also been meeting with congressional members. Uh, is in fact, just two weeks ago, uh, two of our participants met with uh, Congresswoman Robin Kelly to discuss, you know, what it's like for them to navigate the communities that they're in, right? And so having that voice, being able to train individuals and coach individuals in that process really helps build the capacity in our own communities, right, to leverage that voice. Because it's not enough that we just provide these services I mentioned ago. It's really important that we are very intentional in creating a pathway for them out of the situation they find themselves in. Great. I, if we're out of time, I'm happy to sort of end here and we can take the rest up in conversation. I don't know if the <laughs> camera coming on was a sign that we are getting the hook. Um, I did want to acknowledge that there's a question in the chat um, about uh, how to uh, the unique requirements for engaging the community members with lived experience um, in the research without further traumatizing them. So happy to take that in Q and A, but just want to acknowledge that that question. Um, and we could certainly talk about the, what we've learned along the way and the way that we've done sort of it real time iteration, feeding back to the um, providers that are part of this network of service delivery. It's not just Heartland, it's Heartland plus many partners that are sort of um, indigenous to the communities that they're working in, delivering different aspects of the services and the feedback that we're giving them in real time um, so that they can continue to do course correction and, and really tailor and uh, tweak the programming to really best meet the needs of the, those that they are trying to serve. Um, and so this is a little bit of the um, description of, of the individuals and, and some of the um, barriers and, and trauma that they've faced, as well as some uh, descriptive characteristics of, of who uh, the men are in the program. Um, and Thank you. So I will leave it there. Thank you. Let's continue the conversation with, with all the panelists. Um, so with our remaining time, I would like to pose a few follow up questions to our presenters. Um, let's continue learning. I'll ask that all panelists please activate your video. And I'll pose questions to specific individuals and with time permitting, I'll open it up to all the panelists as well. So Dr. Roman, you started us off today sharing insights on building evidence for CVI. Can you talk more about CVI outcomes? For example, getting at long-term outcomes for CVI takes time and can be impacted by other programs or lack of programs in the community. What are some of the most important short-term and intermediate measures for CVI? I, I think this question is not necessarily for an evaluation answer. It's where collaboration is in, and this is, you know, if I were a research partner on a, a project, I would be working with my partners and community agencies to understand what their program means to them, what are the outcomes that they want to see. And, and usually, and I, and we seem to always be on the same page when we think of it as a well being framework, we want this culture of health. And if, if I express what I think neighborhood health means to me, is it the same as those in the community and then starting to articulate. What does that mean? Well, we need to have young people who have someone they could rely on. Is that part of your program model? Is that something we want to measure? How would you measure that? And then we, we ask. So for every program, it's different. Um, but as an evaluator, that's how I approach it and say in the best type of comprehensive evaluation, we are asking the programs themselves and the participants to say, what are those pieces and those steps of change? Is that going to happen in six months? Is that going to happen in 12 months? Are you talking long term change? And then we map it out. And that and that's why I think many um, that are in the audience here know what a logic model is. I am a big believer in the logic model of, of going to communities and saying, map out you what you want. Are these goals something you think you'll see in in 
immediately as soon as someone's through the program or a little bit longer time and then we lay it all out and go from there and then we talk about measurement yes. and data yes thank you and dr roman next question for you and also ms ander please what are some ways to measure whether cbi is affecting the broader structures within the community i'll hand that to rosanna since that's a perfect question for ready chicago and how they're doing it that is a wonderful question. So thank you uh, for asking it. I, you know, I think it's really important so to first acknowledge that the ready intervention is absolutely working with individuals. So, so I don't want to sort of um, uh, hide that fact. It is really an individual based intervention. But what we would like to see happen is um, the lessons from the work that's happening actually change the way the systems writ large engage with these individuals and better meet their needs so that we can see that system. So just to give you some examples, you know, when you look at the men who are sort of um, sort of the priority uh, for the ready program, they face so many barriers, housing barriers, education barriers. Um, you know, if they are uh, earning a, a taxable wage, then they uh, may face penalties in terms of their garnishing their wages because of child support. So really trying to think about how can we take the lessons of what we're seeing and what the barriers are that are sort of holding these men back from having the lives that they they want themselves. Um, how can we feed that information back to the larger system that continue to keep this sort of um, system uh, the way that it is? And so, so while this is an individual based intervention, there are tremendous because of both the quantitative and qualitative work that's happening and the sort of uh, ability to hear directly from from the men themselves. We are able to glean insights that are about larger systemic reform that need to happen if we're serious about um, having different uh, uh, ways out of the, the gun violence beyond relying solely on the criminal justice system. And I'd love to have Eddie talk about the fully free campaign, which really sort of in part grew out of the work, uh, not, not solely, but in part out of the work um, uh, of Ready that is a, also a larger sort of systemic reform effort. Thanks, Rosanna. I, I think, you know, it's, it's amazing when we talk about several years ago, we talked a lot about trauma informed services, right? And I kind of, I chuckled on that because you know, we use that language to apply for grants and so on. But when you really look in deep and you pop that hood open on that on that program, you realize there's not a lot of trauma informed. You know anything about about the program, you know, and so we got to be very. It means very similar to we have to be very conscious about what does it really mean to be equitable um, to think about, you know, in light of what's happening right now with race and equity. You know, what does that really mean for our, for our people? So I'll say this, the fact that we've, we've been able to put over $10 million into the pockets of our participants, right? For us, from day one, is how can we create some financial sustainability in their homes, knowing that it's not enough. When we, we, when we talk to our participants, and we, none of us should be surprised that our participants are, 80% of them have a 10th uh, grade level of education, but they're really reading at the 5th and 6th grade level, how can they become more marketable in the workforce? If they're not working, that means no housing. So there's all these different things, right, that really challenge our work. Not to mention that when, when we talk about this, that our participants on average have 16 to 17 arrests, because they have an arrest or because of the prison time, it really excludes them from a, a number of different opportunities. Um, and so when, we, when Rosanna mentioned the fully free campaign, for us is that, listen, as someone who's been formerly incarcerated, I spent over 14 years in prison, and I've been very blessed and fortunate to be where I'm at right now in my career, but I'm not the norm, I'm the exception. So how can we create this to be more of the norm? And when you think about Ready Chicago and the stages of it, it's pretty much replicating what happened in my life, in the life of many other people like me who've been successful. And so this, this um, fully free campaign is a process, a vehicle, right, to challenge systems to say, hey, this is what equity means for us. This is what opportunity means for us. Let's remove these barriers because today, if I keep pulled over by the police, guess what? Nothing of what I'm accomplishing right now, nothing about this conversation pops up in the police radar. What comes up is my, my past. So at what point even someone like myself becomes free? And that's the direction that we see even with our men within Red Chicago. Thank you. Um, Dr. Israel, you started at the end of your presentation to delve into sharing the benefits of CBPR. Would you like to elaborate, share anything 
that you might have not had a chance to talk about? And more specifically, how can evaluators engage community and program partners in conducting scientifically rigorous CBPR evaluation? Great. Thank you so much, um, Gail, for that. Um, I'll start with a few of the benefits and then I'll get to the other question as well. Um, and I think one of the real uh, benefits is that it enhances the quality and relevance and use of the data. Um, if you're involving community members who've lived the experience, um, they know what kind of questions to ask. They know what's going to be important to learn um, much more than I will. Um, um, I, all of my work is in Detroit. I'm not a Detroiter. I don't live in the city of Detroit. I don't know what it's like to live on the east side of Detroit. But I do know what it's like to partner with community members who can share their knowledge and expertise and help me learn that and then help turn that into data that's going to be relevant to guide our evaluations and, and our um, interventions. Um, and as part of that, it really does strengthen the interventions because it's not me coming in with some book sense about what a, an appropriate intervention is going to be, but what's going to be appropriate in the southwest of Detroit, which is a predominantly Latinx community, as compared to the east side of Detroit, which is predominantly African American community. It's not going to be the same. Um, it also, I think one of the benefits is really joining partners with diverse expertise to address complex health problems. I mean, as we keep saying with community violence, this is such a complex issue. And unfortunately, so much of our work is siloed. Um, and that's often how funding comes across. Um, but we need to not only have public health people around the table, but also urban planners, also, um, you know, people from the legal system, sociologists, et cetera, um, and not to mention within communities. Uh, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, uh, government organizations, and bringing that diversity of perspectives together really enhances the quality of both the, the design of the intervention and the evaluation. Um, and an, another real benefit, and then I'll say some about this, the second question, is it increases trust and bridges cultural gaps between partners. Um, again, from my perspective as a white woman, uh, the University of Michigan is a predominantly a, a white institution. Um, I need to I try to be very sensitive to issues of race and racism. Um, and how do I learn from, again, people in the community that have different cultures from my own? And how do we figure out how to work together and bridge those cultural gaps um, so that the end result is a stronger um, intervention and a stronger evaluation design? Um, and as part of that, then the question about how do we engage community partners in this process uh, for in, in rigorous evaluation, uh, and we pay a lot of attention to relationship building. Um, our first partnership with the Detroit Urban Research Center took a year and a half before we had the trust of the community to say, okay, University of Michigan School of Public Health, you're okay. Um, that, that you don't always have the luxury of that time. Uh, we were also doing some interventions work during that time, but really paying attention to, you know, who's around the table. What are roles and responsibilities? Um, what does it mean to be a member? Um, how do you develop trust? Um, how do you, how do you learn how to listen? How do you learn how to put your, keep your egos at the, at the front door? Um, how do you learn to value, um, everybody's perspective and agree to disagree. So, you know, addressing issues related to conflict, there's always gonna be conflict, you know, uh, uh, working on building trust, sharing leadership, sharing power and resources. Um, if all the funding for a grant goes to the university, that's not a very good model, if you will, right? Uh, if you're really about equity and power sharing. So those are just some of the ways that we have found really help um, engage community and program partners to conduct scientifically rigorous research because they, they have the ownership, the responsibility, uh, and it's shared. Thank you. Mr. Bocanegra and um, Dr. Roman, please. How have you approached funding evaluation activities in a way that complements CVI efforts to reduce violence? Oh, I mean, there's so many ways that I could answer that question, but I think uh, what I'd love to lift up with the audience here, right, is that, as I mentioned earlier in some of my comments, um, you know, the field of CBI, it's, it's a very stagnant field, and 
Chris Roman mentioned earlier, right, about um, the kind of evaluations that are needed, um, kind of mixed research, right, is needed to address this. But the problem has also been is the inconsistency of these services, right, the inconsistency of, of specific models that allows us to really replicate. But it's, 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 it's interesting that when you think about just the this outreach in itself, there is outreach that in, in third world countries and in our in, in our own country we deal around you know, people with with who are HIV victims, right? Um, people who are um, uh, sex trafficking, you know, um, and we think about gun violence. And there's a number of different things, right? That outreach engages individuals because it's about building a relationship of trust. Um, so it for me, like like how much more research do we have to need, right, to demonstrate that relationships when you think about interventions really truly matter. And it's unfortunate and fortunate that when I left the YMCA as an executive director, and one of the attractions of, of this of this work with Ready is it truly it was that there was an RCT behind this and that there was enough funding for me to be very creative uh, and think about how innovative all the things that existed in my life, right in my head, I could really implement. Um, while staying true to to the to the model, right? Which is we're testing CBT, we're testing whether jobs, a combination of that actually helps to reduce gun violence. And I'm, I'm hoping that Rosanna talks about some of the early analysis around that too. But here's the bottom line. I went to grad school so that I can articulate and convey to an audience that does not always look like me or who come from the neighborhoods that I come from to say, this is what it takes to serve this population. Um, so that's one thing. The RCT gives me credibility to say, uh, and I know Rosanna would not say this, but I'm going to say it for her. It is the, it is the most rigorous, you know, um, process of evaluating anything we do with medicine. We do with a number of different things. It, it's it's not the only way that we should evaluate. I want to be really clear about that. But for those who are skeptics of this work, we are able to demonstrate that through this RCT study. This intervention, the intervention of workforce, the intervention of CBT and relationships actually do help to reduce gun violence. And that also includes outreach workers. So I think for the first time, right, like I don't know another program that has that has had an RCT with this specific population. And I say that, um, Ms. Payne, as someone who sat last year with NIJ and some folks from DOJ. And I heard about their evaluations and, you know, for me, what was missing there is that most often researchers only have access to people, to institutions, organizations that allow them kind of a hand distance or, or, or as far as as far as their hand could approach to engage that audience. Those in Red Chicago and many of the cities alike, it is very difficult to work with this population because they're not coming to our doors. They don't want to be found. They don't want to be found. And so. Just the lessons that we're learning through that is really important for the for the for the field of CBI, because it is taking those lessons of what it really takes to work with this population and what are the ongoing gaps of research that exist. Uh, I'll capitalize on. Can you all hear me? My computer is is glitching a bit. Good. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I want to capitalize on what Eddie said, and um, someone in the chat posed a, a question that I think is really important and related. How do we engage community members with lived experiences of violence in ways that do not further traumatize them? And this makes me think of the field of victim services and the research around victim services. There's very, very little research and evaluation material on how we best serve victims and those who have been um, victims of violent offenses. And in Philadelphia, we're doing a process evaluation of the CARES program, and CARES is serving all co-victims of family of, of homicide, those who have lost a loved one to homicide. And we worked closely with the developers of CARES to think about what what research methods we could use that we could learn the most about those who have experienced homicide without having to have them talk or interact a researcher or to traumatize them. So we are actually engaging in a multi-step process to test out a number of research methods where we're first talking with and having long semi-structured interviews with the peer crisis responders who themselves have been 
co-victims and, and talking with them about their daily experiences. What is it like to provide these services? What are you hearing from the families you are serving? And, and slowly over time, as we've built up the trust with the staff, we've talked about expanding to a survey that the staff would administer to those families that they're serving to ask about service needs, gaps in services. And from that, we would think about more rigorous research from there. So I do wanna go back and emphasize, it's a long process, but in the two years that we've been working on this process evaluation, I've learned more than I learned from going in and simply doing a retrospective impact evaluation. We've taken the time to listen to every single staff member to talk with them pretty regularly, sift through what they've told us, and then go back to them is, is what this is what we hear you saying. Is this right? How should we approach approach? the families you're serving, when will they be ready? Will they ever be ready? Um, so I don't know if that gets to um, the, the, the answer that the person in the chat was looking for, but we really try to, to take into consideration that we don't want to just go in and start asking research questions, that it has to be a long-term process, but we really believe that we're building that process mm -hmm. to to inform these areas that have huge gaps in research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And let's let's talk a little more about or move to talk a little about interpreting and using the results once you are successful in what you've just outlined. Um, Dr. Israel, how have you used evaluation results to adjust program activities and sustain efforts to prevent community violence? Okay, so I, again, my work is not directly in community violence, but I've certainly used evaluation for other community interventions. Um, and I think that's, to me, that's what's really critical is how do you take evaluation results um, and not have them be, you know, written up in a peer reviewed journal article and that's it. Uh, nothing uh, happens in terms of wider dissemination and application and potential, you know, translation for policy or other interventions, if you will. Um, so, you know, we've, you know, as an example, just because we talked about the, um, you know, I mean, well, the, the HEP partnership example with the walking groups. You know, as the intervention was going, you know, we did a process evaluation similar to what Katarina was just talking about. And one of the things that we had intended to have a heavy emphasis because was on social support and group cohesion and to be sure that because we conceptually thought that would strengthen the intervention. So it's not just about individual behavior change, but also about the groupness and building a sense of community and support and cohesion. And we were getting a sense that that wasn't happening the way we had des originally designed it. Um, and so based on that process evaluation, we strengthened that component of the intervention. Um, and ultimately, we found, you know, through our um, evaluation, our outcome evaluation, that it, the social support and group cohesion components were two of the major uh, factors associated with the success of groups. Um, so again, using that those evaluation results were just critical um, for making those changes and enhancing the effectiveness of the intervention. Thanks. Um, and with the time we have remaining, I'll open it up for any of the panelists if you have anything additional to share. Um, and one other question I can throw out there is there are many ways to define the effectiveness and success of programs. What are some of the unique approaches that you have used to communicate about your evaluation efforts to communities and the field? I'm I'm glad to start. Um, you know, we've done again, we do a lot with what we call, you know, either fact sheets or one pagers. Uh, I hesitate to say one pagers because there's always two pages front and back. Um, but to really put and we tailor those to both community audiences and policymaker audiences. We usually have two versions uh, and pay a lot of attention to language uh, literacy um, and translation uh, language as well. So that it's, the information is much more accessible 
to the community, to policymakers. Um, we also do um, a lot of uh, op, we've more recently done op-eds, uh, again, to try to get to different audiences using social media. Um, I, I have staff that use Twitter. I, I must admit I don't, but they've been using it to get information out about you know some of the results and the work that we do and interpreting it. Um, so those are just some of the ways we've been um, doing recently. And I, I would just add that, you know, in the times, for instance, in, in addition to what Barbara was saying, we do a lot of, of similar products where we try within the first six months to have a project brief to describe with everyone, with our partners being authors as well. And then any type of process in fact, we make sure we get that to our partners right away. And then usually six months later, we turn that into a brief that's on our website that 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 looks at um, both the strengths and challenges and also has some recommendations. So if there's other jurisdictions that are thinking about doing something similar and, you know, I want to just go back to what Eddie said earlier about we can't forget about innovation, right? We, we can't just say, here's what's out there in the literature and we're going to do that and we're going to replicate that. We need to know enough to be able to think outside of the box to take Uh oh, Thanks. I'm not able. Uh -oh. I think, okay, I think I, I think we lost her. <laughs> Did anyone else want to follow up with that question, or I can, can I just um, elaborate a little bit um, on what the other panelists said, and, and I'm sure Eddie will have something to offer here as well. You know, I think it's. Um, I just want to acknowledge one tension, which is the Ready program. It really, is fundamentally a two-year intervention, and yet we didn't want to wait two years plus another few months to analyze data to be able to share things with the practitioners, with the men in the program, with policymakers and with funders. So we have been sort of trying to share as responsibly with all the caveats around it, what we're seeing with the providers, with, with Heartland, with the funders, with policymakers. Um, and I think that, you know, that's an important thing to do, but it does, you know, cause some real challenges. People sort of um, you know, want to lock in on what the what the results were at the six month point, which might look different at the one year point. So, so we do feel an important obligation to share as much as possible because we do know people have to make decisions. There are things being learned. There is, you know, we don't have to wait until we, you know, the the papers published in a peer reviewed journal. But you know, it, it th there are some sort of challenges that come with trying to be as transparent and, and forthcoming uh, as possible. And so, um, you know, Eddie can probably talk about the cadence with, with, with which the research team and the practitioners are getting together to iterate over and look in a very fine grained way at the data, which of the providers are having a hard time engaging the participants, what's going on there to really diagnose. So it's, it's not just about the impact evaluation, but it's also about trying to help the program refine uh, the model and get better and better. Um, so maybe Eddie, you could talk about the ready stat meetings and the cadence uh, for those. Yeah, so a couple of two things that I want to lift up. One, Rosanna, thanks for, for, for that comment. I, you know, I think that what's, what's really important for us to really understand that most direct, direct service providers don't have a client lab, right? They don't have those kind of partnerships. They don't have databases most often, right? Um, and historically, what they measure is, is uh, outputs, right? They're not necessarily outcomes, and that's really critical for your for the audience for us to think about. Like what you know, what um, Katrina mentioned earlier. Like what exactly are we trying to measure? What exactly do we want to? How do we define success? And for us, we went through the process uh, of doing uh, a logic model uh, to uh, doing uh, a theory of change, and and that has helped us to stay the north, like just stay north, right? Uh, with the work that we're doing. So every week we used to meet once a week now. The collective our, our partnership with the Crown Lab and Ready, we meet once a month, what we call a Ready Stat. We take information, we break that information based on sites, based on certain things, and that informs our, our, our you know, our, our staff. And then that information gets assimilated on the ground level. And we do a lot of uh, technical support around it, how to understand that data, how to use that data for your strategies. Every community is slightly different too, um, because of gang dynamics and, and, and because of other lack of resources or some resources in, in those communities. So there's so much that I could say around that that, that I you know don't have enough time. 
But here's what I do want to leave um, for, for this audience and, and for those who work in government. You know, when we think about CBI, it's really important that we think about what outreach looks like and how do we support that. In addition to what's been lacking is the tools for many of the outreach workers to have partnerships, right, for housing, for mental health, for family support, for court advocacy, right, for reentry specialists. Those, those, those things that I just mentioned often get overshadowed when we think about community violence reductions because we focus only on intervention and street outreach. But the success of what, what to whatever degree we have within Ready is because we've been able to incorporate all of that, and we're still falling short. So there's been so many lessons behind that, and one of the greatest lessons that I will leave to you here is that if we're serious about reducing violence that it's not just about simply getting more money. It's like really building the capacity of many of our nonprofits to be able to have the back office support to support, support those who are on the front line. You know, I, I'll conclude by saying this. My, my brother who served in the military for many years, he's a highly decorated veteran. One day he told me, Eddie, for every soldier you see in the field, there are seven other soldiers supporting that one frontline soldier. That's the same mentality that we need for direct services and direct service providers. We have to understand it takes really a village and it takes true collaboration, particularly with agencies that have been, they've been harmed, sometimes by research institutions. This is why I love our approach with the crime lab because it's been very inclusive. So I'll just end there. Thank you. And thanks to all the panelists. I think it's been very powerful information um, and very helpful lessons learned. Um, as we are coming to the end of this webinar, I'd like to remind participants that this webinar is being recorded and we will post the recording and the presenter slides online when they are available. Please take a few moments to fill out the brief survey through the link that was posted in the chat and share your thoughts about community violence interventions. I want to again thank all the presenters today and all of you who are viewing this webinar and special thanks to everyone involved in putting the webinar together. As was just stated, it does take a village. This concludes our presentation on community-centered evaluation within community violence intervention. Let's go forward and remember the words of James Baldwin, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Thank you, everyone.